This week, we lost one of our oldest, most senior members who passed away. Tommy Puckett was 99 years old. We're planning a celebration of her life service in June, and we'll let everyone know when those details come. But Tommy was fun. Tommy had some stories to tell, and she stayed active and sharp to the very end. I, can't, I don't get to say this to people anymore, but I loved saying, I have a church member who knew Margaret Mitchell before she wrote Gone with the Wind. It's my favorite Tommy story. And Tommy talked about the premiere of that movie with enthusiasm and nostalgia. We probably would have to say that was Atlanta's first foray into the movie business in 1939 when all of the biggest Hollywood stars showed up in front of the Lowe's Grand Theater on Peachtree Street. And Tommy was in on the news throughout that time. A few other people remember those days. The sanctuary that we're in today had been here on the corner of Ponds and Highland for over a decade by 1939. It had been the spiritual home of thousands of people. And as people continued coming and going through these doors, they would see a lot of change take place decade by decade. And I've heard some people complain that the church isn't what it used to be. It's not like it was back in the good old days. But then there are other people who understand and affirm that this is actually a good thing. Because God doesn't command or even ask us to stay the same. Quite the opposite. God invites individuals and churches to change and to evolve. And the Spirit of God sweeps through our halls and through our lives, converting our lives not just one time, but again and again, if we're willing to let it. Just as the biological world that we live within is evolving, so our spiritual lives evolve and expand. And just when we think we've got it all figured out, God steps in and shakes things up and says, oh no, there is still more. Now as we step into the scriptures today, we are with Peter in one of the most transformational moments on his spiritual journey. And, and his actually might be the most transforming and evolving life of faith that we see in Scripture. For Peter grew up in a typical Jewish family, hearing the Scriptures read, observing the Sabbath very carefully, eating only the most appropriate foods, spending his time with friends who did the same, and then joining the family fishing business like a good son was supposed to do. And then his life changed. On the day that he meets this traveling teacher and he feels God urging him to not just rock the boat, but to get up and get out of it and follow. And over the next few years, he learns the life of a rabbi and he comes to believe that this one, this is the one that is going to lead Israel, the one we've been waiting for. He anticipates being part of the next revolution that's going to free his people. But his world is transformed again, this time by tragedy. When his teacher and his mentor and his friend is killed, is executed as a criminal, and he goes into hiding and grief and depression, and he learns the spiritual truth that God is with us in the darkest of places. Even when we are hiding, we are not alone. And when he feels like he's at his lowest and there's no hope, he sees the risen Christ. He's called back into service in the world. He's empowered by the Spirit of God and strengthened to start over again. Strength that he is going to need because it is not going to get any easier. And then he and his friends are arrested and they're jailed for subverting the religious system, for questioning the status quo. He sees friends being killed. 
Now at this time, as they are out speaking of Christ, they still see themselves as a branch of Judaism. They are still following the laws of the Torah, but they're also worshiping Jesus as the Messiah. And this is where we find Peter in this life-changing moment. And this story seems to be so important, it's repeated twice and referenced again. It's described in chapter 10, and then Peter is retelling this story as we read it today. Something transformational is happening. Luke, Luke writes that Peter stayed in Joppa for a time with a tanner named Simon. And then it tells us, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the tanner. They're really specific and repetitive for a reason. The Simon the tanner was an outcast. He would have been considered dirty by multiple senses. Tanners worked with dead animals, and that would make them ritually and religiously unclean. And I don't know if you've ever been a part of it, but making leather stinks. Tanning smells really strong, and it's not good, and it gets in your hair and your clothes and your skin, and you can't get it out. Pretty much anyone in their society could have felt superior to Simon the Tanner. But this Simon, this Tanner, had joined the Jesus movement he had found acceptance where the rest of society would never give it to him. And so Simon the Tanner hosts Simon Peter the Apostle in his home. Peter's faith had been stretched and opened up to sharing hospitality with anyone of his Jewish faith, no matter their status. Simon the Tanner was still a part of the Jewish community, although frowned upon for his occupation. So on this day, God is pushing Peter a little bit farther, pushing that envelope. The purity laws he had followed all of his life forbid him to associate with Gentiles, especially one as questionable as Simon the Tanner and then a Roman soldier named Cornelius. But he has this dream that won't let him go on living the same way. Peter describes this as a trance or a vision, and he sees something large like a sheet coming down from heaven. It's being lowered by its four corners, and he tells his friends and those who are questioning his questionable choices, I looked at it closely, and I saw four-footed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying, Peter, get up and kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. To Peter, this menu was repulsive. None of those animals that he saw in the great sheet was acceptable food. His no was a response of repulsion that was deeply ingrained. But the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. And while he's thinking of what is he going to make of this vision that he has just seen, some people show up at his door telling him that there is an Italian soldier that wants him to come to his house. Coincidence? We think not. More like a confirmation that the Spirit of God was about to change his worldview again. He explains, the Spirit told me to go with them and to not make a distinction between them and us. And he did. And he saw for himself that the Spirit of God had touched their lives too. Now he is able to say, if then God gave them the same gifts that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who could I be to hinder God? God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or in unclean. And I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Acceptance. God's acceptance is not grounded in obedience to rules or uniformity, but only in God's great parental love. And in accepting Cornelius, this Italian, this Roman Gentile enemy, as fully part of the Christian way and the Christian faith, 
This evolving faith is acknowledging that diversity is a gift of God. And that God will always be revealed in a variety of ways and the Spirit of God is alive and moving within any culture or ethnicity or age or gender. But this kind of change wasn't easy then and it isn't easy now. It takes a long time of training to teach a person to fear a particular group of people. It takes even longer to teach us to be repulsed by that person or that kind of person. It takes people that you trust and you love and that you need in your life speaking of those other people as dirty or barbarians or pagans or lazy or mooches or criminals or evil or terrorists or animals. And if you hear that enough over time from the people that you trust, you, you can't help but believe it. And you can't afford to doubt it because there will be consequences in your life. It's good old-fashioned conditioning, as reliable as training your dog. Now, some of you may not want to use that invisible fence system to train your dog, but it usually works. There's a fence that has a wire along the desired boundary, and the dog has a collar, and it buzzes whenever the boundary is approached. And the dog learns basically through three senses, the visual cue that he's come to the end of the grass, there's an audible cue as the collar beeps as he gets close to the buried wire. And finally, he can count on an unpleasant tingling sensation from the collar if he crosses over. And gradually, with practice and conditioning, the dog learns to stay in the backyard. Crossing that invisible fence gradually becomes repulsive to the dog. And unfortunately, we are not that different. You might have been taught that civilized people don't eat bugs. Some people eat bugs. You might have been taught that successful people don't live out of their cars. You might have been taught that socialists are evil, that transgendered people are just perverted. You might have been taught that women need to stay in their place and let the men lead. You might have been taught that all Muslims are terrorists. These lessons are not easily unlearned. Would any of our coral scholars in the back like to pick up a verse or two from South Pacific? No, no, I'm not going to sing. But the lyrics go like this. You've got to be taught to hate and to fear. Anybody humming along yet? You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. I think of this song often when my patience grows thin with people who confidently tell us that certain kinds of people can't be Christian or American or worthy of assistance or protection. I remind myself of this song when I hear people in power refer to someone as an unwanted element in our nation, or our city, or our neighborhood, or when desperate families are compared to animals. And then I remind myself that God is not done with me yet either. The result of a divine, a true divine encounter with God is transformation, deep change that moves us to think differently and to live differently. And everybody here might be saying, I've got this, I'm woke, no problem. But the Reverend Karen Georgia Thomas reminds us to say, remember, transformation hinges on self-awareness and truth-telling. Even our reluctance to see ourselves as we are 
right now in this moment will hinder God's transformative work. Our reluctance to name the places where we are deficient in our hospitality or to own up that we have much work to do in ourselves, in our community, this causes us to embrace that old false story of who God loves and who God doesn't love. So maybe we need to ask ourselves the question, in your life now, in our life together, who is unclean? Who, who is it easy to hate? I know, you don't hate anybody. Who is it hard to imagine sitting down to eat with? Who do you not want to share a meal and a difficult conversation with? I think one of the reasons that we don't want the let, to let the Spirit of God take us into this kind of transformation is because it's hard and it's painful and it's exhausting. If I'm going to sit down and have a meal and a real conversation with someone I completely disagree with, with someone I'm sure couldn't possibly know the God of love that I know, someone who is ignorant and is obnoxious and, oh wait, I just started name calling and they haven't even set out the food yet. Did I mention this is hard work? The hard work of love that Jesus did every day when he put up with his very slow to change disciples and relatives and colleagues. To accept the people who are unacceptable requires that we listen a lot with patience. To accept the people that society or maybe just our in-group tells us are unacceptable requires that we try very hard to understand who taught them to see the world the way that they do and to understand why it could be so very hard for them to see the world the way that we do. And it also requires that we know what we're talking about, that we have our facts straight about what we believe or what we know to be true about the world or what we hope for for the future so that we can share our truth with enthusiasm and without name-calling. Because name-calling is what we do when we don't want to do the hard work and slow, patient participating in God's movement to transform the world one annoying stranger or relative at a time. But this is the work that God is doing in the world. This is the work that the Spirit is doing moving in these halls and in this city and in our world. And now we together can say with Peter, God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And now I realize that it is true that God does not show favoritism.